Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very glad to be joined again today by Jonah Goldberg, uh, senior editor at National Review, uh, holder of the Cliff Asnes Chair in Applied Liberty at mm -hmm. the American Enterprise Institute. Very impressive. It is. It's, uh, it's no, very impressive sounding. I agree. Cliff Asnes <laughs> is a great guy, so it's good for him to do that. I'll, uh, uh, and um, author of the new book, just out, I think, as this conversation. Right. Coming out in about a week as we speak, but out as we release the conversation, Suicide of the West. Yes. It's a cheerful title. It is. I think um, I've seen that title somewhere before. You have. You have. James Burnham Say wrote a word about uh, that. You just appropriate other people's titles, you know? Well, uh, well, no first conservative of all, respect for private property. Uh, well, though, first of all, let us be clear that you cannot copyright titles. Um, second of all, I had some trepidation about it, even though a big chunk of my argument is... Uh, somewhat inspired by Burnham and by the intellectual currents that inspired Burnham, um, more his managerial revolution than Suicide of the West, which was really just sort of a sequel to managerial revolution. But um, uh, this title was in part negotiated amongst uh, the publisher and myself, uh, among other options. And one of the reasons why I ultimately went with it is that I think the key term is, and we can talk about more of this later, I didn't call it the decline of the West, right? I didn't go right. to Spengler right? Yeah, yeah. or anything like that. The reason I say it's the suicide of the West is because ultimately suicide is a choice, right? It's not the death of the West. Um, big part of my thesis is that uh, uh, what I call the miracle, liberal democratic capitalism, right? This thing that emerged only 300 years ago. We kind of stumbled into it by accident, and the only way we can sustain it um, is by choosing to sustain it. And so much of our culture is dedicated to undermining the moral, political, legal foundations of Western civilization, um, while the rest of us are generally complacent about it. You know, oh, we got my, I got my work to do. Let them go have this, do those silly things in academia um, and the popular culture. Uh, that uh, the people who actually do love this civilization um, and, and appreciate it generally don't do the hard work of fighting for it. And so, like as Charles Cranhammer said, decline is a choice, Yeah. so is suicide. Yeah, that's good, no, that's good. I think if we'd been having this conversation five years ago, we would have probably got started speaking about how the left is doing all these things to yeah. undermine our confidence in various Western principles and uh, et cetera, and, and institutions. And But the subtitle, we should go back and have that conversation yeah. at the end of this conversation, because I think, <laughs> I think that remains true. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but here the threat is how the rebirth of populism, nationalism, and identity politics is destroying American democracy. Right. So let's begin by, I mean, talking about that. You had a wonderful column just a few weeks ago. Let's hope Steve Bannon never comes back from his European <laughs> tour. Bannon had gone over to Europe and spoken to, I think, Marie Le Pen's party, the National mm -hmm. Front, and uh, embraced kind of blood and soil nationalism in Europe. And you correctly, in my view, <laughs> told him to stay over there, which he did not listen to, I believe. But, alas, uh, alas, yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit. How, why is that? Where did that, that threat come from? Is it as much of a threat as, as you suggest in this book? And Well, all right, so... Um, uh, Rewinding just slightly, right? So one of the things that a lot of people uh, today just sort of assume is that, that first of all, the, forget nationalism. The nation state is a natural thing. But uh, nation states you know, come out of what? The Treaty of Westphalia, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that we call nationalism is actually a remarkably recent um, ideological construct. You know, in the academic literature, a lot of it is just called romantic nationalism mm -hmm. because it comes out of the romantic era. And mm -hmm. it starts basically in the 1800s. And, um, you know, it's funny that the, you know, you hear all this stuff about globalists and all that kind of thing. Um, the Western civilization used to be much more globalist. I mean, the Catholic right. Church was a global institution by definition. And, uh, and, and the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, you know, universal principles of mankind, right, all of these right. sorts of things. And uh, the, the romantic nationalism re emerges as a sort of angry response uh, to the Enlightenment, and uh, specifically, it emerges as an angry response to the Napoleonic invasions of, of Germany and Europe. And all of a sudden, you get people like Johann Herder and Jan Ficht um, inventing this idea of, in the case of Germany, the German nation, right? And one of the most fascinating things, if you go back and you read Ficht's address to the German nation, um, is how to the modern ear it sounds like he's a Nazi, 
Mm. But it's totally unfair to him to call him, not even though he was a terrible anti-Semite, but he wasn't, uh, not, the, the biological racism as a concept didn't exist. You know, right. it was 150 years later that comes, or 100 years later it comes around. Um, for Ficht, it was all about the German language, so also for Herder. And they, wanted, they believed that the German language was the most authentic, real language. It was the only language unsullied by the taint of Rome and Latin and all this kind of stuff. And what you find is, is that uh, it was this rebellious impulse against having the Enlightenment imposed on people. And so part of my larger big picture argument is that the Romantic era never went away. Because what romanticism should properly be understood as, as sort of your internal human nature rebelling right. against modernity, against the Enlightenment, against the, all of the various forms of the division of labor that come from living in a modern society. Bourgeois. Bourgeois Boredom. lifestyle, right? Yeah. This idea of um, living in an open free society based on contracts and the rule of law. It feels unnatural because it is unnatural. And, uh, and so it requires sort of constant vigilance. As Reagan used to say, you know, um, we don't inherit liberty in our blood. Um, every generation is one step away from barbarism. And I think that's exactly right. As, or as Hannah Arendt said, every generation Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children, mm -hmm. right? And we have to, mm -hmm. civilization is a process where you civilize uh, humans in the raw and turn them into citizens in a, in a free society. And that takes a lot of work. And so one of the amazing, just to fast forward, one of the amazing things about America is that it was not invested in or a product of the sort of romantic nationalism of Europe. And um, it was uh, the only successful, at least at the time, enlightenment-based revolution. And uh, what, the, what the Americans did is they took these quirky, weird attributes of English culture um, that had less to do with philosophy and more to do with the fact that the English were just weird. They were weird people for all sorts of Whiggish, weird artifacts of history. You know, they never had standing armies because they were in islands. So you never had a really powerful king who could impose absolutism. You, um, the, the Roman Empire really never had the kind of impact on them that they did in, in other parts of Europe. Uh, and they had these strange notions of property rights going back to the 12th century. And so what Americans did is they took the those sort of cultural aspects, they kind of put them in a centrifuge, spun them around, and turned them into abstract principles. And we founded a nation basically based on those. And, um, and this is why, you know, and my friend Rich Lowry doesn't, doesn't like this quote, uh, but that's why Bill Buckley always used to say, I'm as patriotic as, as anybody there is, but there's not an ounce of nationalism in me. Because what nationalism does First of all, there are many different kinds of nationalism, and there's a certain kind of civic nationalism that has healthy, and I've always argued that a little nationalism is a good thing, but um, certainly ethno-nationalism, uh, or the sort of hard nationalism that says all you need to know about somebody is their nationality, is no different from any other form of identity politics. Right. And if I, could, if I could recommend, I know I'm going a little far afield here, but um, you know, I've been locked in my room like Howard Hughes with Kleenex boxes on my feet <laughs> writing this book for several years. So um, uh, if I could recommend to, to viewers or listeners, however you imbibe Crystal Conversations, um, one of the best essays that Orwell ever wrote uh, was called Notes on Nationalism. And he begins by saying, I can't basically, I'm paraphrasing, um, he says, he begins by saying, I, I can't quite come up with the right term for what I'm talking about, so I'm going to call it nationalism. And what he's really identifying is identity politics, feminism, uh, racial identity politics, all of these kinds of things, which, which as he puts it, uh, force people into these abstract categories that are allegedly tell you all you need to know about them. And, um, uh, and, and that's why I think that sort of hard nationalism, just like hard populism, is really just a form of identity politics. It's, it's the logic of the mob that says we are part of this undifferentiated we, we are sacred, we are um, sanctified. If you're opposed to us, you are an external enemy. And um, I think that that is uh, hardwired, that, that, that tendency is hardwired into every human heart. It is part of human nature because we grew up in tribes and we grew up in little troops or evolved in these little bands um, to have this us-them distinction. 
the trick of a civilization is to keep human nature to some extent in check. And so people like Bannon, um, who I think has a thumbless grasp of most of these things, uh, he very much wants to, I mean, he admits he's a Leninist. I mean, he uses the term. Right. He just, he very much subscribes to this idea of the worse, the better. And he wants to tear down existing institutions. He wants to tear down um, the establishment, however defined. Um, and he, and the very definition of a radical, someone who, you know, going back to the Latin radix for roots, right, wants to tear down things from the roots or, or, or destroy things from the roots. But he has no conception of what to replace it with. And so he, it, when you have that, like with all radicals of the left and the right, um, he has a very high propensity to say incredibly asinine things. Um, and uh, because he's invested in keeping people extremely angry and resentful. And so, you know, he says, he says to the French, uh, you know, uh, convention was the National, At the National Front. National Front. Yeah. Yeah. He says, you know, let them call you a racist, wear it as a badge of honor, right? Which is insanity, right? And, but that's, that is his approach to these things. And I do think we should be grateful that there was a time, I think when we, one of the first times I was on here, where it seemed like the alt-right and that crowd was going to have a lot more cultural oomph than they do now. And it turns out um, that so much of that fever swamp nastiness was really just sort of, you know, epiphenomenal to this cult of personality of Donald Trump, and um, and you know, it turns out, I would argue, and I've argued at great length, that we should stop thinking of Trumpism as a anything like a coherent political ideology, or even a political platform. Um, it's a psychological phenomenon, right? And it emanates from Donald Trump's lizard brain, um, and it has all sorts of corrupting influences. But he has no serious time horizons about the kind of country he wants to see. He is, you know, he's not a chess player. Um, he is driven almost purely by the his sort of his, his narcissistic desires for respect and for admiration. And you just have to wonder what, how much worse things could be if he had, say, Pat Buchanan's brain, you know. Or, or could still get, though, because, I mean, I think you do make the point in the book, as you just said, that let's just call this Rousseau, I mean, mm -hmm. you make the Rousseau versus Locke distinction, so let's just say this Rousseauistic tendency in America, in human nature is real, and yeah. uh, we would prefer, I think, society that organized on Lockean lines, and we might make, you'd make this in the book, uh, more complicated arguments about how Lockeanism doesn't preclude a healthy kind of civic right. patriotism, and Lincoln thought a lot. It's not like anyone, one of the most annoying things I find about the current nationalists is they talk about liberalism in such a cartoonish way, as if right. intelligent, liberals ranging from statesmen like Lincoln to thinkers like Tocqueville and Mill and everyone, really, Raymond R. Orwell, you name them, right. didn't think a lot about, well, how do you strengthen these aspects of a liberal society with a healthy kind of civic spirit? Anyway, but um, I'd love for you to talk about that too, but, uh -huh. but, but even if Trump were to go away, I mean, the tendency is there, and it does seem to be somewhat around the world too, that this revival of a certain kind, you know, a feeling of liberalism hasn't panned out or is boring or is... Yeah, no, I think that's and, right. And that this, we need to kind of look back to this nationalism populism, which I agree, it sort of in a liberal context looks kind of romantic and a little yeah. entrancing and a little sense of frisson of excitement. But of course, you lose track of how quickly it can go off the rails. Right? No, that, that's right. I, mean, it's, I, I guess I should just back up and do my sort of how we got here point, right? Um, you know, in the book, I start... 250,000 years ago, but I'll skip ahead yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. The next conversation uh, we'll go to, though, yes. You know, one of the... 13-hour conversation, <laughs> the first 249,000 years, right? <laughs> um, one, of, uh, uh, one of the biggest influences on me in working on this thing was reading Joseph Schumpeter. And it turns out that Schumpeter, I think, was an influence on a lot more of the mid-20th century mm. conservative intellectuals than we realize. I think Burnham gets a lot from Schumpeter. I think your dad got a lot from yeah. Schumpeter. That book was bigger. I mean, I'm a little older than you. When I was sort of going to college, yeah. in that world, that book, Capitalism and Social Democracy, yeah. had a huge impact and reputation. I think it's really faded. I, it do people talk about it anymore? Bizarrely so, because yeah. I think it's actually being borne out quite well. That's interesting and, to talk about that, yeah. All right, so, um, you know, Burnham, He's an interesting guy, right? He, uh, he said, what he, he has this great line, he says, um, uh, I have set out in my life to do 
three things, to be the world's greatest economist, the world's greatest... Schumpeter. The Schumpeter. This is Schumpeter. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Schumpeter, yeah. 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 So he says, I've set out to be the world's greatest economist, the world's greatest uh, uh, lover, and the world's greatest horseman. And it takes a pause. And he says, it's not working out so well with the horses. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, he... Uh, so he has this argument that... Um, uh, he basically, as his biographer Tim McGraw, or McGraw, I can't remember his first name, puts it, he flips Marx on his head, right? And according to Marx, the the, the proletariat will realize their class consciousness, and they, it's eventually, an, it's a materialist version of the Christian narrative where the meek will inherit the earth, right? They'll take over and overthrow their rulers and break their chains and live in essentially a romantic utopian world. And um, Schumpeter turns that on its head, and he says, no, if capitalism goes, and he thought it would, um, it'll go because of the children of the rulers. And uh, he makes this point that, um, which I think is absolutely borne out sociologically, uh, with obvious exceptions, that um, uh, rich people, industrialists, right, they tend to have lawyers as kids or, or poets, right, or... Uh, social workers or artists or, mus or authors or whatever, they have intellectuals for kids, um, as, speaking broadly. And because of the affluence that capitalism creates, uh, these intellectuals, what he calls the new class, right, which Burnham calls the managerial class, um, uh, they have um, a mass market for what they're producing because people get rich enough to actually care about this stuff. And at the same time, they are filled with uh, uh, Nietzschean resentment, right? F F Nietzsche uses the phrase resentment, which is the French version of resentment, so we'll go that way. And in, so in Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, which Schumpeter gets a lot from, uh, Nietzsche tells the story about how the priests, who don't have any real power, they use words and ideas to undermine the existing virtues, right? They, they invert the existing virtues and turn them into vices. The knightly class, the rulers, the aristocrats, they don't care about, you know, these abstract notions of morality because they make their own morality and they're in charge and they run things. And so what the priests do is they come in and all of a sudden they say that strength is actually a vice, not a virtue. They say that courage um, is not as good, is the opposite of meekness, right? And it's, it's part of Nietzsche's anti-Christian, anti-Jewish stuff. But this dynamic in, for Schumpeter works pretty well, where you get uh, a priestly class, a new class, who are raised to be deeply resentful of American capitalism. And they are, um, they are sort of like backseat drivers. They are constantly saying that liberal democratic capitalism is bad. We could do things so much better, you know, whether it's the Paul Krugman types or whether it's the Occupy Wall Street types, you know, there are different varieties of it, but the indictment is always the same. And um, the problem is, is that as capitalism succeeds more and more and more, it creates more and more and more of, these re of this resentful class until it really truly becomes a mass class. And they control what Lenin said were the commanding heights of the culture. If you go to Hollywood, you just listen to any award ceremony coming out of Hollywood, right? You read most of the stuff in the New York Times, you read most of the way history is taught in universities, and it is just an unending indictment of the society that we live in. And uh, the way I often, the metaphor I like to use, remember the movie Goldfinger, right, with James Bond movie, right? So uh, Goldfinger didn't try to rob Fort Knox. What he wanted to do was irradiate all of the gold in Fort Knox so that it would become unusable for anybody else. Mm -hmm. And therefore, his stockpile of gold would become infinitely more valuable because he had the second biggest stockpile of gold. If you look at, like, say, Howard Zinn's History of the American People, what he does is he says, he's, he's explicit about it, most widely read history textbook in America, right, still. Um, and he says, my history of America is the history from the view of the Native Americans, from the slaves, the history of, uh, the, from the Trail of Tears, from the, the, the uh, oppressed coal miners, right? It's just one victim group after another. And what he's doing is saying that this is the only usable history that we can have. And um, the history that says this is a good country, the history that says that we should be proud of the American experiment, that we should be proud of the unfolding liberty that comes out of the Declaration and the Gettysburg Address and Martin Luther King's March on Washington, that's all nonsense. You can't have that. You can only think of Columbus 
as a genocidal murderer. And uh, that's all what the new class is doing, is like you watch every documentary that's up for an award at the Oscars, you watch um, uh, sort of every political movie that comes out. It is always, it is considered the height of bravery to just pee from a great height on the American tradition. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I basically closed the book by saying what, what the country is really suffering from is a profound lack of gratitude. And we teach people not to be grateful for this country. But that seems, to, I mean, that, so I think that is very much the narrative that my father and many, many other people thought was applicable to the new left mm -hmm. in the late 60s, spoiled kids of pretty wealthy parents, and, and that's why one reason Sean Pater and these others were so... The kids pulling up so the paving rich. stones in the 68 riots were all the sons of rich lawyers. They right. weren't like construction right. workers. And it was you the know? construction workers, the cops, who were more we'll grateful to this country and thought they had a chance to yeah. do better. But what about, the, but this is really, but, so how does that manifest itself on the right, I guess? I would say. Okay, so, so part of it is, um, and this is why I think identity politics is so unbelievably pernicious, right? Um, for... Um, the last 30, 40 years, uh, Mary Eberstadt had a fantastic essay in the Weekly Standard about this. You know, we get this rise of identity politics basically out of the breakdown of the family. And that what happens in part because we are all wired to want to belong to a group, to get meaning from the group, to feel like we're part of a tribe, right? And that's the Rousseauian part of us. And it is a valuable and important part of us. Um, uh, but you get this rise of identity politics in part because people aren't getting from civil society, starting with the family, the proper sense of belonging and meaning, the feeling that they are needed in their own communities. And we can talk about social media making all this worse, but this is, a, this is the, what you get with the, get the breakdown of civil society. And so instead, people race to these abstractions. And you know, uh, racial identity politics is the best example of it, all this nonsense about intersectionality. We don't have to get in the weeds and all that. Um, and so for the la if, you just, if you go look at the course catalogs or the literature from any Ivy League school, and there are scores of classes on uh, African American this, on, on Hispanic that, there are African American studies centers, there are black studies centers, there are gay and transgender lesbian studies centers, I and mean, all these kinds of things. This grand archipelago of identity politics, both in the classroom and on the campus. In a smaller number of campuses, but a growing number, there's also these things called whiteness studies, right? And so in all the black studies and all the Hispanic studies, it's all about teaching the greatness of racial solidarity, identity politics, solidarity, black pride. And I'm not against teaching some of that stuff. That's not my point. But the whiteness study stuff is expressly, read the syllabus of any whiteness studies course, it's all about dismantling whiteness, dismantling white privilege, white supremacy, all of this Todd Nahisi Coates stuff about white supremacy everywhere, right? About the immutability and the iron cage of race and racial identity and how we can never transcend it. Um, and so we've heard from the culture, from elite culture, from popular culture, that white people are just bad, right? And um, I don't know about you, we both grew up in New York City. I've never in my life ever said, well, you know, as a white person, yeah, I think. Right, I mean, right. I just, I never identified my identity as white. It was never, it never really part of, and if you say that to see people on the left, they say, well, that just shows you how right. deep your false consciousness, white privileged garbage is. And so you, you have, because of the new class, all of these people being taught that the history of this country is evil, that the greatest accomplishments of this country are evil, oppression, cruelty, whatever, um, that we've never, we've never gotten past slavery and that it, things really haven't changed much since slavery. So many people have said this, right? Um, you never, you know, no one gets to say, hey, look, my ancestors fought for the Union Army. I'm not responsible for slavery, right? It's just, it's this blanket American sin, permanent and, and, and undilutable. And, and so when you do that, when you, you are by definition encouraging people to think of themselves in terms of their racial identity. Mm -hmm. And I, I argue that one of the reasons why the right went off the rails as much as it did was um, because and I, I've written anti-populist stuff for 20 years. And I, I love all these people who tell me, oh, you just don't like populism because of Trump. Well, no, I'm going to go back and read stuff I wrote in 2005, you know. Um, but the Tea Party movement was the only populist movement I ever supported, right? Um, and because it was, first of all, it promised to fulfill that ancient libertarian prophecy of 
libertarians taking over the government and leaving everybody alone, right? But second of all, it was exactly what you, if you could, I didn't think it was possible. You could design a populist movement to fight for. Re, uh, return to limited government, mm. constitutionalism, living within our means, balanced budgets, low taxes. Um, it was, I mean, yeah, there were some idiot freaks and cranks at the periphery, but idiot franks and cre creeps show up at any po big popular movement where right. there's a chance to monetize it or get attention. No, right? I totally agree. The Tea Party always struck me as the populism in the service of something close to classical liberalism, yeah, it was, which was great if, because you could have populism anyway. So you, mm. Right, but, th but this was the kind of, and I, I think the reason why we got the Tea Parties was a lot of it was a delayed backlash against George W. Bush and John McCain, but that we can get into the rank punditry about that later. My point is, is that these guys were, um, I mean, I used to go and speak to little Tea Party groups where they would have book clubs reading the Federalist Papers, yeah. you know, and um, and yet the, the new class, the mainstream media, Hollywood, all these guys, they called them racist anyway because they couldn't get out of their head that this happened under Barack Obama. And they demonized them as racist. My old friend Andrew Breitbart, you know, he offered a $100,000 reward if anyone could provide evidence that the claim from the Congressional Black Caucus guys who walked through a Tea Party protest were uh, pelted and spit upon and called, you know, the N-word and all that kind of stuff, and there must have been 10,000 iPhones up or cameras up, there was no evidence of it. The Congressional Black Caucus just made it up. And MSNBC round the clock calling them racist. Um, and I think that for a big chunk of the populist right, there was a kind of psychic break. And it happened not just at the grassroots level, it also happened at the leadership level. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Anton, who wrote the famous DC's uh, Flight 93 election thing, in a debate that he since has deleted, yeah. um, uh, he and I went, a went after each other about the notion of colorblindness, which I think is sort of essential to the American creed. It is essential to the sort of, to liberalism properly understood. And this is all in the context of Trump attacking the Mexican job judge, and who wasn't Mexican. And, uh, and Anton, then under the pseudonym Decius, uh, says, look, that old standard is dead. Colorblindness is dead. Merit is dead. We now just live in a society full of identity politics, and our only choice is to have our own identity politics and to fight fire with fire. And, um, and I think at a lot of levels, what, what the right did was basically cave to the ca racial essentialist categorical thinking of the left. And um, this is not to say that all Trump supporters are white supremacists or anything like that, but if you tell people all the time that their culture and their heritage and the heritage that they associate with their father and their grandfather and that they associate with the movies that they love and the stories of their of their country that they love and all you do is tell them over and over again that this is this is all white supremacy and evil it is only human that you would start to say hey, wait a second you know my dad was a pretty good guy or i thought world war ii was a pretty good you know effort yeah. and you start owning your racial identity and so there's all this social science that shows that people who expressly considered whiteness to be part of their core identity voted for Trump overwhelmingly. Mm. I don't want to encourage anybody to think whiteness is their core identity. At least American is is a more capacious term, right? And but it was a, you know it was an aside. But I remember the New York Times had a review of a book on the history of the Ku Klux Klan um, during the height of the Tea Party stuff. And the author, the reviewer in the New York Times, opens with like four paragraphs about how um, Herman Cain, an African-American leader of the Tea Party, proves that Klan-style racism can take new forms in our modern society, right? Uh, yeah. And so when you tell people that, you know, having black leaders doesn't mean you're still not racist or that you believe in colorblindness and limited government, all that kind of stuff, that means you're racist. If you just say the Constitution is racist, which you hear from very intelligent people on the left all of the time, you encourage people to think in these same ways. And, um, and so I think that a lot of the populist back, you know, it's funny. So you, you tweeted out a praise for this response that Ramesh and I had in this exchange with Rich Lowry about, about Trump criticism. And uh, E.J. Dionne tweeted out a thing. This is very good, but maybe you guys need to think about what conservatives did that made Trump possible. And I responded, I'm fine. And I think I've been doing that quite a bit. 
Um, maybe liberals should think about some of the things that they did that led to, that made Trump possible, the backlash that made Trump possible right. too. And hundreds of, how dare you say liberals have anything to do with it? How mm. dare you say the left is at all responsible for creating any kind of climate that made Trump possible? Barack Obama deserves a lot of the blame for the creation of the moment that we're in with Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton deserves a lot of the Democratic Party, the mainstream media, these guys fueled a, a resentment day in and day out on the right. Fox deserves a lot of the blame too, and I've said that many times, but this is an American problem. It's a cultural problem. It's much larger than just sort of um, finger pointing. But what we're having, and, and uh, anyway, just to wrap it up, um, the reason why populism becomes so much more attractive in all of its forms, nationalism too, is that the ecosystem of civil society, which is sort of like wetlands, it, it serves as a filter, right? It, 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 it allows um, pollutants and, 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 and nitrates and all these things to be absorbed into the soil before they go out to the sea. Um, local institutions, that ecosystem is in really dire shape. And so what happens is people, as Robert Nisbet would put it, have you know, this, this quest for community innate in them, this desire for meaning that is innate in them that was an evolutionary adaptation. If you didn't have social solidarity in the tribe, you were wiped out by another tribe. Darwin talks about this at great length. And, and so when you can't find meaning and belonging and that sense of community at the local level, you retreat to things like Facebook, which gives you this, which do not give you community. What Facebook gives you is confirmation of your worst instincts, and they, they, they reinforce your resentments. And, and so what happens is people start looking to Washington for meaning that they can't find closer to home. This was the essence of the life of Julia thing, right? I mean, Yuval Levin is brilliant about this in The Fractured Republic, where um, Barack Obama in his second inaugural lays it out plainly. He sees America as having two fundamental units, the individual and the state, nothing in the middle. And it's the middle stuff that is really important because no one lives in the United States of America. They live in their own communities. And, um, and so, and I think I've talked about this before on this uh, show, but um, you know, the opening words of the Democratic Convention in 2012 were government is the one thing you can all belong to. And for me, that's creepy. But for a lot of people, what they hear is an invitation to belong, to feel like they're part of something. And Populism uh, is this way of feeling like you're part of this national group. It's a really cheap and shabby form of group and community, but it feels real. It's the ecstasy of the, of the crowd. And, um, and because we are retreating to our homes and we're not actually engaging in civil society, we are now increasingly watching politics as if it's a form of entertainment. And when you watch things as a form of entertainment, you just simply want to root for your heroes and against your villains. And so, so much of our culture now is defined by what I call in the book, ecstatic schadenfreude, where you just, you don't care if it's good policy. What you care is if it makes the other side angry, right? That is so much of what Trumpism now is. Oh, oh, yeah. oh their tears are delicious, as if this is a justification for a tax policy or anything, right? But that that is the sort of, psychic moment that we're in. It's this romantic desire to, to punish your enemies, to this tribal desire to feel part of one group that is conquering another group. And we all do it basically virtually online and, and over television. How much is, I mean, since you mentioned Facebook and all uh -huh. that, how much do you think social media, I mean, these, you know, obviously liberalism can be strengthened or weakened by all kinds of technological developments, economic developments, yeah. and so forth, or both at the same time, and a lot depends on how they get managed. How much do you think, though, the sort of social media, broadly speaking, contributes to this this form of conservatism rising and the old, the other form of, let's call it classical liberalism yeah. type conservatism, uh, which actually, well, which declining, I mean. Yeah, I, I think it plays a huge and significant role. But, you know, one of my favorite lines from Orwell is he says, you know, man can feel himself a failure and take to drink and become all the more of a failure because he drinks, right? Our problems are upstream of social media, but because we take them to social media, they become worse. Um, a good analogy, just as by way of explaining, is um, pedophilia, right? Bear with me for a second. A um, hundred years ago, if you were a pedophile, very difficult to find another pedophile who 
shared your right. proclivities, right? Um, you are really socially isolated. The internet allows these people to, first of all, feel like they're not alone, right? Which is a hugely important part of people's psyche. And, and further allows them to feel like there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. And so social media allow, it, it, you get this feedback where you say something absolutely disgusting and terrible about somebody else. And 500, 1,000 people tell you, right on, go for it, you're so brave, you're so awesome. And it exacerbates these things. Also, um, you know, take it away from pedophilia for a second, um, or maybe forever, uh, in, in local communities, and Robert Putnam gets at this quite a bit, um, uh, liberal sociologist from Harvard. He did this huge longitudinal study. He hated the findings, so he held off for a year, hoping that he could disprove them. He couldn't, and found that uh, large, sudden waves of immigration or diversity in a community um, are deeply corrosive, in the sh at least in the short and medium term, to social trust. And, and it's not because of racism. It is because of, uh, by simple virtue of the fact that if you have ethnically or culturally homogeneous populations, they all share the same customs, dances around a maypole, whatever you want to call it, Little League, whatever, um, and they know how to adjudicate interpersonal conflict face-to-face, -face, right? If your neighbor is also a Norwegian guy in Minnesota, it's pretty easy to say, hey, you know, your tree is dropping crab apples on the lawn. If he's a Hmong from Vietnam, and he doesn't speak your language, it's much more difficult to have that kind of civic, social, polite interaction. And so what you find is that people, first of all, withdraw from civil society, but second of all, they start looking to the state to adjudicate problems they used to be able to do themselves or maybe go to their pastor or their priest or whatever to adjudicate them. And the second thing they do is they retreat to online and they go onto social media and they go onto Facebook. And on Facebook, you know, they might say something terrible about immigrants and people they don't know, people they don't meet, say, you're absolutely right, I'm 100% with you. And it becomes this confirmation and, and acclimation kind of thing that um, I think is deeply poisonous. And you know, uh, Facebook, I, I'm not on Facebook, but Facebook I think is really good for maintaining contacts with friends you already have. It is a very different thing with people that you don't know. And so you, what you, one of the, you know, and, and Ben Sass, you know, he points out that we have a we have a, a loneliness crisis in this country. The share of people, the number of friends that the average American has, close friends, has fallen almost in half in a very short period of time. And I think a lot of that has to do with this atomization that you get from the breakdown of civil society, from people retreating to online communities, which are not the same thing as real communities, and and it leads to this polarization. Um, and this sort of tribal mentality that you get in our politics. So is this, I guess, reversible? I mean, so many conservatives you and I have read over the years um, have embraced different versions and degrees of this. This is what liberalism is, atomism, individualism, something like the social media. It's no accident, comrade, that right. you, you put together technological development and this kind of country that we have and the breakup of the family and a million other things, the modern capitalism that you get at this this development, and you and I could sit around yearning for something other than either nationalist populism on the right or identity mm -hmm. politics on the left, but aren't those the kind of semi-inevitable outcomes of modern democratic capitalism, and aren't we? So it's not really suicide, it's, it is kind of a decline of the West. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, look, um, you know, Schumpeter- Oversimplifying a massive yeah, 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 argument yeah. here. Schumpeter was more pessimistic than I was, right? He kind of almost made a dialectic that it was uh, doomed, right? Because part of his point was that capitalism depends on uh, institution, what he called extra-rational concepts, or it's basically social capital, that it cannot create and cannot restore one's lost, right? And this sort of relentless creative destruction and rationality of inefficiency of capitalism uh, isn't corrosive of just bad institutions. I mean, people forget that so much of human liberty is the product of the market, right? I yeah. mean, the market is you know, up until the invention, the invention of money um, and market mechanisms uh, provided for the first time in, in human evolutionary history a solution other than violence for the exchange of goods and services, right? So in, in, in man's natural condition, 
if you have a basket of apples, my way of getting an apple from you is hitting you over the head, right? Um, money gets to say, uh, or trade allows you to actually have non-zero-sum exchanges. And, um, and what the market does is it lowers the price of dealing with strangers, right? Because we are wired not to like strangers, and it's a very powerful part of our wiring. And the market tells us, no, 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 a stranger isn't bad. He's maybe a customer. And um, it's corrosive of discrimination. I mean, one of the things people don't remember is that among the chief opponents of the segregation laws in the old Jim Crow South were the busing companies, were the bus mm -hmm. companies, because they, for them, this was an outrageous regulation that said, we're going to, you know, it puts putting regulatory burdens on us. Mm -hmm. um, markets don't like discrimination because they are, um, they, by definition, they lower your customer base. And, um, but markets are also corrosive of other things, right? And they're corrosive of, of some good things. And, you know, we're all prone to nostalgia about the terror, about the wonderful businesses that close because they can't make it in the modern economy and look what's happening to bookstores and all of the rest. And so I, I do think that conservatives are not cognizant enough of the costs of having a free market economy and the creative destruction that's necessary, even though I would not get rid of them under any circumstances. Um, but what is required is doing a better job of civilizing people. And, um, uh, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of Arthur Schlesinger, but the, the concept of the vital center is an important one, right? And um, um, I closed the book, you know, basically I, I try to explain it you know, on the suicide thing. If, if, if you were suicidal, what would I try to tell you to keep you from making a bad decision. And among the things I would tell you, look, you still have so much to live for. Look at all you great things that you've accomplished. Look at how many people care about you and need you. And I would basically teach you that you should have not despair, but gratitude, right? right. And we have a gratitude crisis in this country where, um, you know, the opposite of gratitude is entitlement. And entitlement is just sort of a legal version of resentment. It's basically saying, mm. simply by virtue of my existence and my feeling of grieve, uh, aggrievement, I deserve more than I'm getting, and you are obliged to give it to me. But if, but, but gratitude says, my God, look at all these amazing things that we have. I should be grateful for this. You know, Yuval Levin likes to argue that, um, that conservatism is gratitude because you only want to conserve those things you are grateful for. But we live in this very romanticized culture which says the ultimate source of authority is your internal feelings, right? Um, that is the essence of romanticism, going back to Rousseau, is that the, the inner lamp of your feelings is what guides your way in the world, and that, um, uh, you know, if you talk to college, you know, if you follow the politically correct nonsense on college campuses, you know, you get these people, like that stupid controversy at, at Yale about the dorms and the masters and all that, you know. Mm -hmm. You have this guy trying to reason with this student, saying, hey, look, you know, I was, let's have a conversation about this. And she says, you know, I don't want to have a conversation. I want you to respect my feelings, right? And that we are teaching people. You know, th these things are being, I'm a big believer, and one of the big influences on me in the book is Deirdre McCloskey, who basically says this miracle was created by words, just words. But the rhetoric, this bourgeois rhetoric that emerges in the 1700s that redefines what is right and good in mm -hmm. the world. And... Um, and so I think we can repair this stuff, but what is required to repair it is to start teaching kids that maybe they should be grateful to be in this country. Maybe they should be grateful for the accomplishments of our ancestors. Maybe they should be grateful because, yes, we had slavery, but we also fought a war to end slavery, right? And instead, it's this constant harping on the victimization thing, which breeds entitlement, which breeds grievance. And, you know, in the Bible, um, you know, the commandment is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember is not just simply a thing about your memory, your recall. It is an activity. It is a verb. It is an action. Yeah, like and it's honor. A, yeah. yeah, you have to honor and 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 we have to, you have to teach the barbarians that are born in every family why they're lucky to be here, why this is ultimately flaws and all a good and great country, and you don't do it in this jingoistic nationalistic way. You do it in in a classically liberal way of open-heartedness, of gratitude, of 
being open to your foibles, but nonetheless seeing that we are different. You know, the American exceptionalism debate, I think we've talked about this, but it's so depressing. It used yeah. to be that American exceptionalism was understood, you know, Donald Trump hates American exceptionalism because he doesn't understand it. He says, oh, that, you're just saying that America is better than other countries, as if he doesn't believe that anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, what American exceptionalism, going back to Seymour Martin Lipset and those guys, and Bryce and all those guys, right, and de Tocqueville, um, yeah was a two-edged sword, right? It was this, on the one hand, there's these wonderful things that make America different because we didn't have a feudal past and because um, we have this culture of, uh, this bourgeois culture of equality and all the rest. But on the other hand, we have things like we're more violent than other countries and all these kinds of, but we're just different. We now can't teach or talk about American exceptionalism because a lot of really smart, dumb people instantly hear white supremacy or nationalism. And so, I think we can repair a lot of this, but it was required is for people like you and me and the people who are watching this show to actually open themselves up to having a conversation about the good side of the coin of America and our culture. I think immigration helps with this a lot. You could make a case that, this is a little oversimplified, but throughout American history, in fact, what Trump had expected and what Daniel Bell and a million other people have right. talked about happens. That is the, the actual descendants of the successful people in America get complacent and take it for granted and so forth. But you have these waves of immigrants mm -hmm. and they are very grateful because they know what the alternative is and they just fled from it. Uh, whether it was, you know, uh, Ireland in 1840s or Russia in the 1900s or obviously Europe in the 1930s. Uh, and this was brought home to me. So I was giving a talk last week actually uh, and uh, got an unusual question. This was at a college from an intelligent conservative kid, it was actually active in the conservative politics there, who had gone somewhat alt-right though. And so mm -hmm. it was sort of a, was, oh, Mr. Crystal, it's, you speak about all these democratic norms that you're worried that Trump is damaging and the rules and conditions of a liberal democracy, but that's boring. I find that boring. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and don't most people find that boring? You People can't fight and die for that. and They don't live for that. I want an, something to live for in my politics. And, and I gave a somewhat lame answer, I think. I'm so, so surprised to get that question. I'm familiar with the argument, obviously, yeah, yeah, but I, yeah. I just sort of I tried to explain, oh, this is very much worth, you can get your fulfillment existentially from other things. You don't want this kind of fulfillment in politics. It's very dangerous, mm -hmm. like a little electron. That. But afterwards, this young man with an, somewhat something of an accent, so a, an immigrant of some kind, um, his parents had been immigrants, and he you know, come over as a kid, presumably, uh, came up to this other kid and gave him a really much better answer than I gave him. Yeah. Saying, look, you can take it for granted. For me, living in a free country where I can choose what to you know, pursue my education and what books to read and yeah. where to live, that is, that's exciting, that's not boring. Yeah. And of course, in that respect, wars and enemies and you know, all the challenges of life bring it home, I suppose. And yeah. you don't want to have wars for that sake and you don't want to have depressions for that sake and you don't want to have crises in Europe so America can be, Rejuvenated, but there is some truth to that. Of no, course. look, I, I, mean, look, I, I, I agree with you as a historical matter, very strongly. I, I want to push back on it a little bit, though, in the current context, and only in this sense. At the University of California, um, they issued a memo last year or something with a list of problematic trigger phrases that you're not allowed to use to students. Among them, "America is a melting pot." That is now considered a bigoted and insulting thing to say. Assimilation. Bigoted right. and insulting, right? Um, America's had previous waves, big waves of immigration, for which I think we should be grateful. But into a classical liberal. But in and it was yeah. ex, there was the amount of pressure. I mean, under Wilson and some of that, the the pressure that on Germans was I actually think tyrannical and evil. You know, yeah. I mean, the banning German language associations. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it was, it was almost totalitarian in, in the sort of oppression that a lot of German Americans went through back then, but. The ideal was to err on the side of turning people into Americans. Well, and right. now the idea, I mean, remember when Bobby Jindal said that immigration without assimilation is invasion? And now yeah. I get it, he was doing a little popular spiel there. But his, his, his basic point was pretty decent. And the scorn that was heaped on him about he's an Uncle Tom Indian and all this nasty stuff that was hurled at him. If the idea of becoming an American um, is now considered to be you know, a form of oppression and tyranny, we're screwed. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, again, I, and, and the right, you know, the, the left deserves enormous amounts of scorn what they're doing. But this is a perfect example of how the right is saying, if you can't beat them, join them, right? So at CPAC this year, I'll 
keep, keep the story short. A, a moderate Democrat radio host was on a panel, and he said, um, you know, I lived in Mexico for a few years, and some of the people down there were really culturally conservative, and, you know, you guys would like them a lot. Audience boos. He then says, you know, I was, um, I happened to be at a courthouse one day when there was a swearing-in ceremony for, American, for, for immigrants, and I have to say it was just this unbelievably moving and beautiful thing. Audience boos. He then says, you know, the Democrats do this thing where they have a table set up outside the room and they register people as Democrats once they come in. You know, Republicans would be kind of smart to do that too. Loud, sustained boos. That is mind-bogglingly stupid, right? I mean, it is, it is, I mean, forget evil or bigoted or dumb, you know, but it's just, it's, it's, these are no longer, right. anyway, these are American citizens. And there is now this idea that, um, I, I get the argument, we don't want them in this country. But as a political matter, say we don't want them in our party. You know, we don't want their yeah. votes. <laughs> that, is, that is truly suicidal yeah. and, and repugnant. And so you're now getting the left saying, you can't assimilate, don't try to assimilate to America because America is corrupt and bad. Don't go to the Republican Party because they're evil and corrupt. And now you're getting Republicans saying, or conservatives saying, and we don't want you anyway because we think you're filthy for foreigners. This is a recipe for a real problem. Yeah. Whereas I would say, I mean, despite our bad, uh, foolish way we try to, don't try to assimilate anymore and don't teach civic education, et cetera, uh, and there's a welfare state which has its own issues with, sure. with, with mass immigration. I still would say a lot of the immigrants actually do have much more naturally just because they can't really. Yeah, that's true. They, they, they bring a lot I mean, of social capital lot of, with them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't really beat it out. You know, our stupid yeah. school system can't quite beat it out of them. But, you know, I was thinking about this. So just uh, we're speaking, what, uh, April 13th, Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. so, so nothing else happens the rest of this day. Yeah. Um, we're going to emerge from the studio <laughs> and, and intelligent I mean, apes are going to be ruling the planet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that would be good for the book or bad for the book uh, sales. Probably bad, know, but, yeah. you know. And um, uh, if so Depends how intelligent, actually. <laughs> okay, good point, yes. And uh, so earlier this week, Paul Ryan announced that he was um, – Stepping down, not running for election for, to the House, and therefore mm -hmm. ending his term as Speaker at the end of this year. And I, we all had written about it, but I had the thought that uh, listened to you here. Mm -hmm. One of the very few politicians in America who would have uh, understood, and I dare say, uh, enjoyed this conversation, yeah. and maybe we'll watch it. In fact, on conversations, uh, is Paul Ryan, yeah. and probably one of the ones who would have most been most sympathetic to your argument and yeah. my argument about classical liberalism, and um, and. In 2012, it seemed you know, he was Romney's VP. He had succeeded in persuading House Republicans, pretty yeah. impressive achievement, to get on board dealing seriously with entitlement reform and so forth. He had a, I think, set of views that were very consistent with what you, you and I like. And uh, that was the rising new Republican Party and star of the conservative movement. And six years later, he's gone and Trump is president. I yeah. mean, really, what an arc in six years. So, No, it's the I mean, it, it's funny, you know, I mean, 2012 was also around the time where Arthur Brooks, uh, our friend, uh, president of the American Enterprise Institute, was making real headway in his, you know, he saw his mission as going out and converting the left and convincing them that really conservative policies can do more to help the people that they claim they want to help. And uh, Paul Ryan was deeply influenced by a lot of that stuff. And, you know, it wasn't wasn't necessarily George W. Bush compassionate conservatism, but it was this idea of sort of um, getting past a lot of the the stale um, categories of policy and, and whatnot, actually going down on the ground. You know, so Paul Ryan did his poverty tour and all these kinds of things, and it really seemed like both on the intellectual side and on the political side that that even though Obama won, that you know things looked fairly promising, and um, yeah, that's over. <laughs> and, um, yeah. uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I've been arguing for a long time now in the era of Trump that stripped of all its ideology and, 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 and prudential and traditional adornment and all of these things that you and I care a lot about, down to the basic metaphysical struts, conservatism basically is just about two things. And it's about um, the idea that character matters and the idea that ideas matter. And this is the, uh, this is the liberal part of it, right? And, or the classical liberal part of it. Because when you say ideas matter, what you're saying is, is that we can employ reason 
and facts and evidence and logic to persuade people that one idea is better than another idea. That is the essence of the good part of the Enlightenment, right? And um, um, and that's what democracy depends on, is this idea that you can, you know, if we live in a deliberative democracy, the whole idea of deliberation only makes sense if people ha can change their minds about things. And the character part gets at the heart of what it means to be a sort of a cultural conservative, which is that there are certain eternal best practices, habits, right? I mean, I think the most profound thing that changed civilization was when the, I, the concept of God-fearing went away because God-fearing suggests that even when you're alone, there is this external entity watching you and judging you, and it is a real check on human nature and human conduct. And, uh, and good characters, is sort of, you know, the, the Hallmark card version of good characters is simply what you do when nobody else is watching. And um, it seems to me that one of the reasons why I was opposed to Donald Trump from the beginning is that he stands athwart both of those pillars completely, utterly uninterested in ideas, utterly, except in an instrumental mercenary way about how well they aid his sort of Nietzschean will to power and his narcissism and all that. Um, and his relationship to good character is an ocean apart. I mean, he's just, you know, this is a guy who cheated on his first wife with the woman who became his second wife and then um, cheated on his third wife with a porn star. And um, he defines, uh, you know, all good behavior based purely in relation to the loyalty to him. Um, you know, this is a guy who, uh, you know, he has gave this famous take on Roy Cohen, his old, you know, the guy, his old lawyer. Um, and he said, you know, all these white, it's in the, I think it's in the art of the deal. He says, you know, all these proper Wall Street guys who think they, you know, are all prim and proper and do the right thing and, and all that, they're not really your friends because if you're in trouble, they're going to run away from you, right? By which he basically means if you act scummy, they're not going to want to have anything to do with you. And he says, but someone like Roy Cohn, he's with you no matter what, right? He's with you to the end. He'll visit you on your hospital bed. And the only reason I bring this up is that when Roy Cohn got AIDS and was in the hospital, uh, Donald Trump, because of his bigotry about all of that, completely um, severed all ties with him and, and didn't re reciprocate the loyalty one way at all, or another at all. Um, and in that sense, Paul Ryan stands as almost the exact opposite of, of Donald Trump and, and really exemplifies, you know, look, I mean, he cares about number stuff in ways that I don't, and he's a bit of a geek and all of these kinds of things. But Paul Ryan is an, in, an intensely decent guy who believes in good character. He's a family man. He has solid, real values, and he models them in his life as best as he can. And he cares deeply and passionately about ideas. And so for me, it's, it's this almost literary moment where um, this guy who was essentially too good for what the Republican Party has become has just said, I can't do this anymore. And it's very, it's a, I mean, it's, it's symbolic more than anything else because it became Trump's party a while ago. But the symbolism is, is really sad. And also the fact that Ryan, and one could defend or criticize this, I think I'd be on the critical side, but understanding, while understanding, I think what was motivating him, that he went along with Trump. Oh, yeah, I'm not saying I have, I have my disappointments right. with him. So I'm saying that that, too, makes it even more tragic. But that's yeah. makes it more tragic. If, you know, it's not that he, it's one thing to just stand up and fight and lose. In a way, he, yeah. because of where he was and speaker and representing the whole conference, and could he moderate Trump and could right. he get some good things done, he sort of gave up a fair amount of what he cared about. Yeah. over the last couple of years in terms of standards and, and you know, and I stop had the, saying what he believes. I had, I, exactly. I had that conversation with, with, with Ryan where, you know, I had said to him, you know, the damage being done to the party is just enormous. The brand of the party, the brand of conservatism, and, you know, and his standard response, I, it was an off-the-record conversation, but I've heard him say basically the same thing in public many times, so it's, I think it's fine, but he said, like, I can only focus on what I have control over, mm -hmm. and I want to, I have to help my caucus, and I've got, you know, and, and, and to be fair, as a political proposition, he's got a caucus where you've got guys who were elected in a plus 20 Trump district, and you've got guys who were elected in a plus Hillary 5 district, and how you keep that kind of coalition together is very tough, but, um, 
it would have been nice if, if I, I do like to think that if he had just been the head, still the head of the budget committee, right. we would have seen a better version of Paul Ryan during the last couple of years. Yeah, I think that's quite possible. I do think this book really gets to what I think has made us so unhappy about Trump and, and, and critical and uh, in the sense that I was struck, I was getting on a panel the other, uh, a week or two ago with a conservative we know who's a thoughtful guy, a smart guy, would, would very much like this book and be familiar with a lot of the uh, arguments and the books you, you draw, articles you draw and so forth. But he was sort of, you know, look, it's, it's been mostly a conservative administration. I, you know, he's not, he's not my cup of tea. He's not as good as others would have been, but it's not, you shouldn't be too hysterical about it. Sort mm -hmm. of. And um, I guess for me what he didn't see, and I'm curious to what your thoughts about it, were precisely this, mm -hmm. that he's turning, I mean, there's a risk of a, an admirable conservative tradition, mm -hmm. one that's really done quite a lot of good, I would say, for the country and for the world, mm -hmm. really, and also a rather unique one in the sense that where else has a, has a conservative tradition been both successful and in the service of liberty and prosperity, mostly, and, and decency, not, not, not universally, but mostly, uh, turning that into a European style, mm -hmm. Bannon style, conservative tradition. And I think that some of the Trump reluctant defenders, the ones who are intelligent and don't mm -hmm. like him or anything, don't see, maybe we're wrong, maybe I'm wrong that he's so worried about this, but I think that's where we sort of differ. That's why I'm more alarmed and have yeah. more of an urgency about my opposition to Trump, and they have yeah. a little more of a relaxed attitude. It would be sort of like if you had a, I don't know, you know, a party or a team or a social gathering, and there are a couple of, there's a jerk there, and he's dominating it even, and he's making it kind of unpleasant, but at the end of the day, It'll end, and he'll go away, and you won't invite him next time. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the social club goes on, whereas I, I worry he changes the whole character of the oh, gathering. I, I agree with that entirely. And um, although, again, I don't think, it, again, it's like the man who takes the drink and becomes more of a failure because he drinks, our problems predate Trump. Trump right. is a symptom of our problems, and, and Trump and is he, making our problems much I worse. I very much agree with both those things. And and some people say the first as a way of not – Saying the second. That's right. That's He's right. a symptom, not a cause. You yeah. Know? And well, what is that? Yeah, sure. But if it's a symptom that makes things worse, you know. Yeah. If, I, if, if I'm if alcoholic <laughs> and I start drinking grain alcohol, yeah. I'm going to get even. If you're sick and you're misdiagnosed, right. You'd be sicker. Anyway. And so there's a catalytic issue going on here. And um, uh, I think that part of the <coughs> um, part of the way to think about it is, is that particularly for a certain kind of conservative who has who who basically sees politics as a game you know and I don't, I don't mean that in a belittling sense I just mean that's sort of the paradigm that they think of points right. on the board right 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 um, if you're if if, if, um, if you your kids were playing basketball or little league or something like that you would still have this notion you would want to hopefully have this notion of sportsmanship going on right, right. and that um, and that if if you're const if the kids if the winning kid if the key star player is just constantly cheating, and whenever the ref isn't looking, he's throwing elbows and all these kinds of things, you would be more cognizant of the fact that that is modeling beha and it, modeling behavior that the other kids shouldn't mimic. And instead, what we're getting is that, and I think what this I I really do believe a lot of this comes from a kind of part of that partly that psychic break thing I was talking about earlier, but also this deep-seated Saul Alinsky envy on the right, which has turned a lot of formerly intelligent people kind of nuts, um, where, I mean, I remember, I wrote, a, I was one of the guys who put Saul Alinsky on the conservative map in my first book. Yeah. And, um, uh, and but people took from that, um, not that, oh, the left is, that the left fought, play, cheats, right? They, they, they they then went the next step and said, we have to cheat right. too. And then it's, this is the whole world, you know, the whole world's blind kind of, you know, result. And you now have, like, I, the other day I gave a talk at Denison University and um, I made this point about character and ideas and my friend Kevin Holtzberry tweeted it out. And as always happens whenever I make this argument, all these people say, oh, that world's over. That's dead and gone. Well, I don't want that world to be dead and gone. I don't want to live in a sort of just a hammer and tongs power politics right. world. And, and what made it dead and gone? Like one election? Right. I mean, when did the just to defend come? this guy? You know, yeah. and yeah. 
And so, but I look at things, I mean, you should have my friend, you know, David French on to talk about this stuff, but, you know, the most, and there are lots of different examples like this, but the one that I find most depressing and, and most unbelievable if you try to put it in a novel, in 2011, I think it's Pew, they asked this question, um, can a uh, politician live an immoral or in, immoral or indecent life in their private life and still be a good public servant, right? And as you might expect, in 2011, the people who were less likely, least likely to agree with that proposition were self-identified white evangelicals. Uh, only 30% said you could be deeply morally flawed in your private life and still be a good public servant, right? Um, and, they, and so they were um, the most judgmental. Fast forward to 2016, ask the same question, 71% of white evangelicals now say that you can be um, a decent, you can be a good public servant um, even if you're cheating on your wife and whatever. And so now, I mean, the shocking thing about that is not only did the number more than double in favor of the proposition, if those numbers are still true today in 2018, the single most tolerant demographic in American life of marital infidelity and immoral behavior in politicians are white evangelical Christians. I've spent, you spent longer, 20 years defending the Christian right. You know, you know, you used to be friends with Bauer and all these guys, and your dad was a big defender of a lot of this. And I always thought that one of the most disgusting bigotries in American life was this sort of heaping of elite scorn on decent Christian Americans. And I still believe that's true. I mean, I, I still find a lot of that stuff repugnant. What I also find repugnant, though, is this psychic break that we've seen from people like Jerry Falwell Jr., who now want to defend Roy Moore or defend Donald Trump, all purely on this transactional basis, completely defenestrating this old argument that I thought was right, which is that you should expect our leaders to model a certain minimum of decent behavior. And instead, it's sort of like the Hannitization of the American right, where it Hannity gets a call from Donald Trump and says, you got to defend this today. And he goes, okay, boss. And, um, and it trickles down to, to American people. And that is deeply poisonous. And it is going to yeah, elicit a horrible reaction on the left, which is because that's what all of this is dialectic. The left does something bad. The right, because they're tribal. So one of the things about our tribal nature is we have this thing John Tooby calls the coalition instinct. When you're in a tribe, you are or in a coalition. Um, which he's talking about in an evolutionary sense, you are willing to make all sorts of allowances for lapses of people on your own side. You don't see it as defining their character, right. right? But when you see it on the other side, you think that one lapse defines who they are, right? And so Bill Clinton, he proves that Democrats are just scummy, adulterous pigs, right? Oh, but what Donald Trump did, that's different. You know, you have to make allowances. And and so what happens when you have a tribal political dynamic is one side does something bad. The other side says, see, that represents how they do everything. And then they say, we have to do it even worse. And then the other side sees that. And by the end of it, everyone is locked into this Alinskyite nonsense, which just simply says, do whatever you can to win because winning is all that matters. And it's, it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better, I think. Just final point, maybe. <clears throat> You've mentioned the psychic break. What do you call it? The psychic, yeah. <clears throat> a couple of times, and I very much agree. With, what has that sense? I mean, yeah. people like us who've been pretty close to it here for a while, and it sort of seemed to come a little bit out of nowhere. It wasn't obvious. I mean, there were always these elements. They yeah. were there with Pat Buchanan. They were there with Ron, Ron Paul. But they were kind of beaten back, it seemed yeah. like, and didn't seem to be gaining particularly. Um, was there a moment, you think, that, that was key for the break? Was it Obama? I, mean, I have some of the feeling... It seemed like things got much crazier after Barack Obama got reelected. Yeah. Why exactly the reelection of a president by three points yeah. should have been such a psychic blow? I mean, yeah. I wasn't happy about it, but I mean, why exactly that would, you know, but it does seem like that's what set up the Flight 93 election and mm -hmm. all that kind of hysteria, which then leads to justifying everything. Because if it's Flight 93, you don't ask about the character that's right. of the guy next to you who's, you that's know, right. wasting the... Nor and also the, the, the estrochological... Est the, the apocalyptic the rhetoric yeah, so. about uh, Hillary Clinton, too. Yeah. You know, and look, I mean, I think my record on Hillary Clinton is pretty solid. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> really? What are we, yeah. I no, mean. I agree. I don't know. I think part of it, um, you know, there are a lot of guys on our side who deserve a big chunk of the blame who um, said over and over and over again um, in the 2012 election, you know, that, that it'll be the end of America if, if Mitt Romney wins or... Um, 
And then really in 2016, I mean, I remember Hannity would begin his or radio Obama show. Lead, if Obama lead. If Obama yeah. was, yeah. And then in, in 2016, it was Hannity would begin radio. Show. 32 days left of the election that will decide where, whether America survives or not, right? And, um, and I do think – so. And, and part of that, I think, was sincere. Um, wrong, but sincere. I always used to argue if America is one election away from ceasing to exist, it's already over because yeah. the whole point of this country is that – doesn't work that way. And, right. um, but I don't know. I mean, I, and again, I, I do think Barack Obama deserves a, a good deal of blame, his share of blame, right? I mean, it's, it's not his fault per se, but he did like to troll and poke yeah. um, the opposition. But the opposition loved to fall for it and go to 11 on everything. And I bet we could look back. And I remember talking to John Podoritz once about you know, this amazing decline in the faith and trust in institutions that you see across the board. And we were trying to figure out what was the thing that did it. And, you know, his best guess was um, the Catholic Church uh, sexual abuse crisis, which is plausible, right? But um, you can always find one thing a little It's always a perfect storm, back. too, yeah. right? I mean, the social media hitting at the same time is, you know, that probably... But I, I do think it's really worth pointing out... Um, um, I know my logaria is going over long here, but um, I don't know. I want to hear this. Um, you know, I had this argument. I've had this argument with with a bunch of people on the right, including our friend and my boss, Rich Lowry. Um, there is this desire to say that Trump is normal because all Republican presidents and all presidents really have a coalition that involves populism, and I think that. On the surface, that is true, right? As an analytical matter, if you're going to stop at that sentence, you would say, fact check, true. The problem is that not all populisms are the same, right? right. I mean, first of all, left-wing populism is different than right-wing populism. Um, but not all right-wing populisms no. are the same. You know, well, Ronald yeah. Reagan's rhetoric was, yeah. you know, open-hearted, grateful, um, aimed at uh, uh, pro-immigration to a large extent, right? At least the, the narrative of immigration. Um, and his rhetoric, which, again, I think rhetoric is hugely important, right? Um, it defined ideals for the country in a certain way. He never talked as if Democrats, run the, Democrats were bad people, right? Donald Trump's populism is much more European, to bring it back to the Bannon style, right? So it was the old style European populism, romantic nationalism, basically <clears throat> says that the leader is the authentic voice of the people. And anybody who doesn't follow the leader is now no longer considered a legitimate member of the people and that they are internal enemies, bad people, evil people. Um, and that is the rhetoric, that is the populist rhetoric of Trumpism, where it is simply, you know, he had once said at a rally, you know, all that matters is that the people are with me, the other people don't matter, yeah. you know? and. That sort of sanctification of your mass of followers and the demonization of all the other Reagan never did anything remotely right. like yeah. that. Nixon might have believed it, yeah. but even he didn't do much of that. Well, and it makes a big difference, just to sort of uh, add a footnote to your point, really, is that, I mean, all these co huge country coalitions can have all kinds of people in right. them. But and I'm sure if one went back and looked at every congressman in the Reagan era and even at some of Reagan's straight comments, you'd find elements of, let's call it Trumpism. Sure. But and certainly, if you look at Trump's coalition today, you find much more honorable elements. Sure, people just fighting for the good, for, you know, for what they believe in. But it hugely matters who's at the head of it. Right. And 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 especially when that person's the president of the yeah. United States. I've always thought that. And people say well, you're too obsessed with Trump, Bill. You know, it's it's a symptom. And of course, there are all these other things going on. And look what's happening in Europe. But once he becomes president, he's a symptom who has a huge effect on sure. what happens after that. And the fact that Trump is Trump and Reagan is Reagan change, even if in some mathematical way, you know, the coalition was 20% this and 15% right. that. The fact that it's Reagan shaping it gives it one tone and color and character and, of course, and Trump the other. So Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's like, you know, the, the Constitution was written with George Washington in mind, right? right. And, they, and they knew that George Washington modeled certain virtues. And you know, remember, these were revolutions. These are guys who lost brothers and families and just fought a war. And, but they knew because of George Washington's character um, that the Constitution would work. And um, I think the Constitution is still working now, sort of. But, yeah. um, but Donald Trump is, is 
talking about these things and modeling behavior and encouraging forces, uh, you know, your rule of law stuff is exactly right, that um, at the very minimum sets a terrible precedent for the next populist. But the founders had a great belief in the Constitution as they had set up, checks and balances and all that. But they also, Hamilton was willing to sacrifice his life to make sure Aaron Burr didn't become president precisely because they knew that right. for all the strength of the institutions and the, and the, uh, the construct that's keeping us, uh, that's working, you'd also need to, it matters who's, who's in charge. It matters, yeah. yeah. And have you, have, you ever, have you ever read up on the, what Aaron Burr did with the rest of his life? No, I mean, I actually, no, I need to it, study it, it was, Burr I, does seem like actually a sort of It was Trump fascinating. I, I, I had no idea, and then I saw Hamilton with my daughter, yeah. and you look it up, and he goes to Europe for a little while, and then he goes out west, and he tries to start some kingdom of Burr, and, you know, right. and there's no, a lot really. of weird stuff there. I mean, I'm, he's more I'm probably getting than, it wrong. He's more but, impressive you know. than Trump in the sense that he was, really was a kind of <laughs> I mean, he had an ambition to yeah. be Napoleonic or something yeah. like that, whereas yeah. Trump is in a way more vulgar. And uh, But just the vulgar can do a lot of damage, too. I mean, but, you know, he's also, I mean, Kevin Williamson's made this point. Uh, there's a reason why he does his apartment up in the Versailles style. There's a reason why he named yeah. his kid Baron. Yeah. Um, you know, Branding I, the name, the Trump Tower. Right. He, it's all about him. Yeah. And he created his own official heraldic seal, which yeah. is meaningless. And. Um, and it's funny, Schumpeter actually has this, makes this point. He says that the ambition of every um, industrialist, every businessman, is to create as close to a facsimile of uh, a uh, uh, aristocratic dynasty. Mm. And, and I do think that as that comes in our wiring too is this idea of creating, you know, a kingdom within the kingdom. And I think so much of what Donald Trump's presidency can be so much of Donald Trump's president can be understood if you understand that what he really wants to be is a monarch, right? And he wants to be seen as the symbol of the people, right. and he wants to be respected, and he keeps not going to London because they won't throw him the kind of parade that he wants, and he loves military parades, and he and, and one of the reasons why Paul Ryan made the decisions that he made was that Donald Trump had promised him that he was basically going to be a ceremonial president, right. and that Paul Ryan would get to do policy, and that lasted for about five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it could have. I mean, right. Because somehow it turns out that Trump, I mean, he might have been better off deciding to be a ceremonial president. Oh, I think it would have been great for him. It would have been better for the country. But for something about him makes him also want to you know, muck around and all that. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's an interesting question why that is, actually. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's hard to quite, it's, quite it's, figure out. But um, I think we, partly it was the modern populace can't be ceremonial. But being ceremonial means some distance from the public. Sort of a man's right. point, I would say. You can't whereas, appease your base if yeah. you're a symbol for the whole country. Yes, and he loves the day to day adulation, praise, fighting. Right. You know, and that if you do that, you can't then be the constitutional monarch. So he's he's a sort of uh, in conflict in that respect. The, you can't decide whether to be Huey Long or to be, you know, some guy with a heraldic. You know, that's crest. right. And he also so, is bizarrely, while he loves controversy, he hates interpersonal conflict. And yeah. so, I mean, I was wondering this. Maybe you know the answer. All these people have been fired from the White House. Has, in the he, last, has, he, ever, has he ever done it himself? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, it'd be he's, interesting. He's to good find on out. the Apprentice and pretending to do it. Though. That's right. So. It's a sort of reality TV thing. Yeah. So we have a nationalist populist threat. It's it's not going to be the suicide of the West. I hope. You yeah. could have put a question mark there after the uh, in the headline, but that's always wimpy to do, right? You never publishers always tell you don't do don't, no question marks. It didn't occur to me. Is but. that right? Well, that's good. That's <laughs> courageous. That's courageous of you to take on the. But no, I think you're, you make a very good point. You see the headline. I mean, honestly, I saw the title of the book, and you think, oh, it's you know, it's uh, depressing, or it's yeah. going to be. A, but actually, as you say, the, it's not the decline of the West. That is deterministic. Right. I mean, it was. I think it's right. in the uh, Schrangler's case, whereas this is a choice, as you say. Yeah. I mean, the, the first sentence of the book is there is no God in this book, and the reason why I say that is there's all there is there's 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 no outside force, no deus ex machina, right? There's also no Marxist teleology or right. dialectic or any of that kind of stuff. We create the world that we want to live in, and um, if we choose not to do that, we will revert back to human nature, and man's natural environment for 250,000 years was barbarism, violence, and poverty. And the miracle is this thing that we should be immensely grateful for, and instead we're taught to resent it. It's an appropriate note to end on. Thank you for this conversation. Well, it was thank great you. to be here. Thank, thank you, you for, for writing me. the book. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for joining us uh, on Conversations.